Highlighting the best of Cyprus and the inspiring commitment to arts and culture, CultureScope shines a spotlight on the natural beauty and sheer diversity of the island, its previously hidden gems, and the people who continue to make a positive contribution to Cyprus, both locally and abroad. Hello, I'm Paul Lambus and welcome to the festive season special of CultureScope featured on Cyprus Mail's interactive web portal Good Living. With the new year approaching, festivities are in full swing. And what better way to celebrate than by taking a cultural trip across Cyprus and abroad to meet renowned authors, award-winning entertainers, restaurateurs, media personas and prominent individuals who embody the very essence of love, devotion and sense of attachment to Cyprus. I'm Stephen Lilly, the British High Commissioner to Cyprus. As we look forward to next year, I wish you a safe, prosperous and happy 2022. Thank you very much. Dasula Khachitofi, the icon hunter, began her work in the early 1980s repatriating stolen artifacts and is best known for orchestrating the Munich case, one of the largest art trafficking sting operations in European history. I have been repatriating antiquities as a way to heal my pain and my inability to go back home. I'm the daughter of Andriani and Leonidas Georgiou. At the age of 15, when the Turks invaded, we were all turned into refugees. Let us start off with the most important question of them all. Who is Dasula Hajitofi and what inspired her to dedicate her life to bringing looted artifacts home? Who is Dasula Hajitofi to me is very different to who is Dasula Hajitofi to everyone else. I think most of us, we look at identity being equal to nationality and we believe we have one identity. I think we all have many identities. For example, I am the mother of Andrea Sagittafi, who is a businessman and entrepreneur and found his passion on cars and racing trucks. I'm the mother of Sofia Hajitafi, who is uh, mentally challenged and she opened the world of care to my family uh, to understand and have sensitivity in another dimension about these special people. I'm the mother of Marina Hajitofi, who is now 22 and is a student in forensic pathology and found her passion in animals. Um, I'm the wife of uh, Michael Hajitofi, who is half Cypriot, half British. Uh, he's an oil and gas negotiator and found his passion in nature and in gardening. But of course, the one you know me of is I'm the daughter of Andriani and Leonidas Georgiou. These two people were born in Mandre Samohos, a very small village in the occupied part of Cyprus. And um, they moved to Famagusta, to the closed area, or called Ghost City. And uh, we were born there and at the age of 15, when the Turks invaded, we were all turned into refugees. So who is Tsula? Tsula is a businesswoman today, is an author, but is also that little girl that went to bed one night dreaming of her future, carefree, and woke up in the midst of war and destruction, abandonment, betrayal, 
from the, the international community as well as within our country. And when people go through such experiences, I think it marks them for life. It certainly marked me for life. And ever since I have been trying to understand that identity of refugee, of displaced person, if we want to be legally correct, being different, and I have been repatriating antiquities as a way to heal my pain and my inability to go back home. So that's who Tasula Hajitofi is. When I began this journey, it was in the late 1980s. Those days we were working with fax. There were no mobile phones almost, uh, certainly not in every house, and there was no internet. Also, the occupied area was closed. We had no access. Any information to the occupied area was given to me by uh, friends, Turkish Cypriots, who would come to renew their passports in Holland because I was honorary consul, and I would befriend them and they'll bring information to me. I also befriended um, soldiers from the United Nations. I even christened a couple as Orthodox. So they used to bring information to me but information about the looting and evidence about the looting. But then, in order to repatriate something, you have to track it down. You have to find out where it is. And in uh, the 80s, uh, even prestigious auction houses, they were selling uh, antiquities from Cyprus, icons. Of course they did. Um, the, sensitivity about the value of antiquities to the ordinary citizens, especially in affected communities, was in existence. It is really only since the Iraq and Syrian war that there is a lot more sensitivity and awareness about uh, looted antiquities and their link to other crimes. So once you tracked that antiquity down, you had to do preliminary um, evaluation. First of all, is this authentic or is this fake? If it's authentic, who is the legal owner? Is this a religious antiquity? So does it belong to the Church of Cyprus in our case? And if so, which bishopric, which bishopric area does it belong to? Uh, because you need power of attorney for that specific bishop or you need a power of attorney from the Holy Synod to represent the others. Um, once you have that power of attorney, then you have to intervene. You have the right to intervene to the auction house or you have to uh, the right to approach a collector or a museum exhibited looted art and make them aware. But nobody is going to give you back something that they paid serious money for to buy or that they are trading unless you have evidence. So then the game begins. In 1997, you coordinated the Munich case, one of the largest art trafficking sting operations in European history since World War II. The case of Munich, people know and it's been in the media more as a James Bond story as to what I did, or which I couldn't do alone, we did, I had help. But my aspiration is now for people to understand why I did it. You know, it wasn't my job to do it. I didn't get up one day and someone told me, go and do it. I want people to understand why I had to do it. But to go back to Munich, in, by 1997, I already began um, court cases on behalf of Cyprus 
with my hat as an honorary consul of Cyprus representing the government and as a representative of the church worldwide representing the Holy Synod and the Church of Cyprus. So I began court cases in Rotterdam for four icons from the Church of Antiphonites. I began a court case in Japan for the royal doors of Peristerona, which were recently brought back. I repatriated without a penny uh, already the Platanistasa icon, the archangel, which was on loan to the bishopric of Kyrenia, and when 1974 came, it was looted and sent abroad because Platanistasa is not in the occupied area. And I had so many cases like that that people just gave me antiquities when I approached them. But by being involved in this area, it didn't only help me to heal my pain and being more and more investigative and using the Turkish Cypriot friends I had to give me information in the UN, I also understood how the trade was done and that they were criminals. And criminals, you know, they, they have no borders. We have them everywhere. So the art trafficking was done by a number of criminals who were basically looting the churches, cutting the frescoes and the mosaics, regardless whether they were fifth century mosaics like the Kanakaria case, and they were taking them abroad. But that exposed to me the entire chain of um, injustice. First of all, in Cyprus, in the occupied area, there were international treaties that Turkey signed to protect cultural heritage in case of war and armed conflict. They signed it, Cyprus signed it, you know, but they didn't, you know. We didn't take them to court for that, but um, they allowed this to happen. Um, there were United Nations soldiers there. They watched it, they saw it, they, you know, not very much has happened. UNESCO sent envoys the report of Dalibard in the occupied area in 1976. It was never published because Turkey intervened and said this report was produced after a request from the Republic of Cyprus. We don't recognize it. So it went under the window. So you see, they went through customs. How did they go through customs? Then they went to auction houses, unnoticed. People with money, they believed that they could buy them. They had the right to hold an 11th century fresco from a church in their living room if they paid money. The awareness about the immense emotional value that these antiquities had to the ordinary people was not recognized, was not acknowledged. I spoke to the then Archbishop and told him that there were about six steady dealers, controversial dealers, who were all buying from one man, and that was a Turkish national living in Munich, Aydin Dickman. So this man was the link, he had the contacts in the occupied area, he had strong contacts in Turkey, and he could bring the antiquities to Germany and then via these five controversial dealers, dish them out to the auction houses where they were sold. So if we were to expose this, we would have to expose these six dealers. And the only way to do it is to befriend one to frame the others. There was a Dutchman, well, still is, uh, Michel von Rijn, who approached me to sell looted uh, mosaics from Kanakaria Church via me to the government before they were sold to Kohlberg in the States in the, the famous Indianapolis case. I actually started talking to him and collecting information which I deposited to the Attorney General's office 
at the time, and they helped Thomas Klein in the United States, our lawyer, and Michael Cipriano from the attorney's office to win the Kanakaria case. It was that same man, Aydin Digman, who sold those. And Michel von Ryan was his partner. So he actually taught me the game. He told me who was who for his own reasons. So at the end, we had court cases, Cyprus, left and right. And the only way to expose this was to pretend I was to buy antiquities from Dickman and to get the police to catch him red-handed. But of course, I didn't, Dickman didn't trust for Ryan. I didn't trust for Ryan. So you have to read the book to get the story. But we basically had to work together for Ryan and me. And I, on behalf of the Church of Cyprus, was pretending to buy these antiquities via Michel and his uh, thugs <laughs> or friends or whatever they are. And they went to Dickman and I brought Interpol, Cyprus police, German police, and they caught them red-handed. In 2011, you founded Walk of Truth, a non-governmental organization whose mission is to engage the public about the importance of protecting and preserving cultural heritage in areas of conflict. We lobby to change the legislation via roundtable debates and then we try to influence uh, policymakers to adopt new legislation to protect and promote cultural heritage create a platform of citizens to be active, to watch the trade and give us tips so we can intervene and repatriate. And um, building up technologies that we can protect and promote cultural heritage. So this is Walk of Truth. And this year we signed um, a memorandum of understanding with University College London whereby my archives of the last 35 years will be used and catalogued for training and research purposes. And we are setting a research and innovation center to protect and promote cultural heritage and using the cases of Cyprus as lessons learned for other countries. On the 20th of July, on the day to mark the invasion, Mr. Erdogan visited Cyprus. Without a visa, he just turned up. Mr. Erdogan also announced that he would pray in a mosque in my town, in Famagusta, which was never there before. And I went there to face him because he illegally could build a mosque in my town illegally come to Cyprus and go and pray in his mosque whilst us, the refugees, and all the Cypriot and Christians in this country could not pray in our church in Dimio Stavros or St. Nicholas a bit further down the road because it's looted, destroyed, and there was a fence. Now let me tell you something. I shall not ask permission from Mr. Erdogan or any Erdogan to pray in my church. Every hour I invested in my life fighting for justice for Cyprus, but also making it an example for everyone else worldwide who is in the same position is worth it. If I do not go home, in my lifetime, I shall work until the last day of my breath that Cyprus is an example worldwide how to never do it again. On behalf of the High Commission of India and on my personal behalf, I would like to wish everyone a very happy, prosperous and a healthy festive season ahead. Since it first opened its magical gates in 2017, the Fairytale Museum has been welcoming children and adults to an enchanted world of fables and folktales.
Vicky, the Fairy Tale Museum helps children familiarize themselves with the intangible cultural heritage that includes fairy tales, myths, and legends. What was the inspiration behind this unique concept? Η έμπνευση για τη δημιουργία αυτού του Μουσείου Παραμυθιού προήλθε μέσα από τη δουλειά μου πολλά χρόνια σαν οικογενειακή θεραπεύτρια, παιδοψυχοθεραπεύτρια. Χρησιμοποιούσα τα παραμύθια στην θεραπεία τόσο με παιδάκια όσο και με ενήλικε. Και αυτό οδήγησε σε μια μεγάλη συλλογή και μελέτη παραμυθιών. Οπότε αξιοποίησα όλα αυτά τα παραμύθια για να δημιουργηθεί το Μουσείο Παραμυθιού. Φυσικά συντέλεσε πολύ και η αγάπη μου για τα παραμύθια και του θρύλου, γιατί μεγάλωσα με παραμύθια και θρύλου στην επαρχία που μεγάλωσα και όλα αυτά μαζί συντέλεσαν στη δημιουργία του Μουσείου Παραμυθιού. Όπου πήγαινα και έβρισκα κάτι το οποίο με ενέπνε, μου άρεσε και η αλήθεια είναι συναισθηματικά με άγγιζε, τότε αυτό το αγόραζα, το αποκτούσα. Και όλα αυτά σιγά σιγά δημιουργήσαν όλη αυτή τη συλλογή που φιλοξενείται τώρα στο Μουσείο Παραμυθιού. What are the main goals of the museum? Ο βασικός βασικός στόχος του Μουσείου Παραμυθιού είναι η διάδοση και διάσωση της άλλης πολιτισμικής κοινωνομιάς που περιλαμβάνει τα παραμύθια, τους μύθους και τους τρίλους και ανάπτυξη της φιλαναγνωσίας στα παιδιά. Ένα όμω βασικό στόχο του Μουσείου Παραμυθιού, ο οποίο σχετίζεται με την ιδιότητά μου ως ψυχοθεραπεύτρια, είναι η ανάπτυξη τη ψυχική ανθεκτικότητα των παιδιών μέσα από την ανάγνωση παραμυθιών. Τα παιδιά, όπω όλοι γνωρίζουμε, έχουν μια τεράστια φαντασία και έναν τεράστιο αυθορμητισμό. Μέσα από τα παραμύθια, τα παιδιά ταυτίζονται πιο εύκολα με του ήρωε των παραμυθιών και μπορούν πιο εύκολα να επεξεργαστούν ζητήματα που απασχολούν τα ίδια τα παιδάκια. Τον φόβο, την αγωνία, τι ανασφάλειε, την χαρά. Όλα αυτά είναι πολύ πιο εύκολα τα παιδιά να τα αγγίξουν μέσα από παραμύθια και να τα επεξεργαστούν τα ίδια και να ξεπεράσουν τις δικές τους αγωνίες και φόβους. Οπότε θεωρώ ότι το Μουσείο Παραμυθιού μέσα από τα προγράμματα που αναπτύσσει δίνει την δυνατότητα αυτή στα παιδιά πραγματικά να έχουν σε επαφή με τα συναισθήματά τους, να αναπτύξουν την συναισθηματική νοημοσύνη τους και να συμβάλλει με αυτόν τον τρόπο στην ανάπτυξη τη ψυχική ανθεκτικότητά του. Ένα άλλο στόχο όμω του μουσείου είναι και η ανάπτυξη τη δημιουργικότητα των παιδιών, και γι' αυτό και είναι και ένα μουσείο interactive, έτσι διαδραστικό, ώστε τα παιδιά αξιοποιώντα τα εκθέματα να δημιουργήσουν τι δικέ του ιστορίε και να αναπτύξουν τη δημιουργικότητά του και τη φαντασία του. Όλα τα εκθέματα μα, στα οποία υπάρχει, έχει υπάρξει μια επιστημονική τεκμηρίωση από κάποια ερευνήτρια λαϊκών παραμυθιών. Όλα τα κείμενα υπάρχουν και στα ελληνικά και στα αγγλικά, ώστε να μπορούν οι επισκέπτες να ενημερώνονται, να μαθαίνουν μέσα από τα εκθέματά μας για τα παραμύθια και τα λαϊκά παραμύθια. What are some of the programs and events offered at the museum? Προσπαθούμε συνεχώς να εμπλουτίζουμε το μουσείο με εκπαιδευτικά προγράμματα νέα που να αγγίζουν όλες τις ανάγκες και τις ηλικιακέ ομάδες. Κυρίως όμως επικεντρωνόμαστε στα παιδιά νηπιαγωγείου και δημοτικού και έχουμε εκπαιδευτικά προγράμματα για σχολεία. Καθημερινά μας επισκέπτονται νηπιαγωγεία και δημοτικά σχολεία και τα παιδάκια συμμετέχουν σε θετροπαιδαγωγικά προγράμματα βασισμένα σε παραμύθια. Τα απογεύματα έχουμε τα Tea Afternoon, όπου κάθε μήνα είναι αφιερωμένο σε ένα παραμύθι και μας επισκέπτονται γονείς με παιδάκια για να συμμετέχουν τα παιδάκια τους στο αντίστοιχο πρόγραμμα. Και Σαββατοκύριακα έχουμε διάφορα άλλα event, εκδηλώσεις, εργαστήρια φιλαναγνωσίας, έχουμε διάφορους συγγραφείς που έρχονται εδώ και διαβάζουν τα βιβλία τους, εκθέσεις. Συνεχώς έτσι προσπαθούμε να προσφέρουμε στα παιδιά όσες πιο πολλές ευκαιρίες γίνεται για να διασκεδάσουν, με έναν τρόπο όμως δημιουργικό και ποιοτικό. The Fairy Tale Museum is an extension of the Family Institute of Cyprus, an educational center for systemic applications and family psychotherapy. Tell us about that. The Family Institute of Cyprus is an organization that provides family therapy, therapy for children, and child psychotherapy. It has as a goal to develop programs that will enhance the family system and the children, and to develop their authenticity. Especially in our days, this is very important. Σημαντικό με όλε αυτέ τι προκλήσει που υπάρχουν και τι διάφορε κρίσει. Οπότε, μέσα από τη λειτουργία αυτού του κέντρου που δημιουργεί και εκπαιδευτικά προγράμματα για επαγγελματίε, προέκυψε η ιδέα του Μουσείου Παραμυθιού. Δηλαδή, ήταν συσχετίζονται τα δύο, γιατί έχουν τον ίδιο στόχο ουσιαστικά. Δηλαδή, πέρα από την διάσωση των παραμυθιών που έχει το Μουσείο Παραμυθιού, ο κοινό στόχο των δύο οργανισμών είναι η ανάπτυξη τη ψυχική ανθεκτικότητα τόσο των παιδιών όσο και των οικογενειών. Και χαίρομαι πάρα πολύ που το Μουσείο είναι ένας χώρος που ενισχύει τον στόχο μας για να καταφέρουμε να προσφέρουμε όσο πιο πολύ στήριξη και βοήθεια σε οικογένειες και παιδιά. Είναι η εποχή που όλα κυλούν πολύ γρήγορα. Τα παιδιά με τερεθίσματα από την τεχνολογία 
έχουν μάθει σε πολύ γρήγορου ρυθμού να αναλλάσσεται η εικόνα, να αναλλάσσονται τα ερεθίσματα πάρα πολύ γρήγορα. Το να καθίσω να διαβάσω ένα βιβλίο προποθέτει μια παύση. Προποθέτει το να καθίσω και να διαβάσω σιγά σιγά, να γυρίσω τη σελίδα σιγά σιγά, να ξαναδιαβάσω ή να καθίσω και να ακούσω κάποιον να μου αφηγείται μια ιστορία. Προποθέτει μια παύση από αυτόν τον γρήγορο ρυθμό που θεωρώ ότι είναι πάρα πολύ σημαντικό να εκπαιδευτούν τα παιδιά σε αυτές τις παύσεις. Γιατί είναι κάτι που το χρειαζόμαστε συναισθηματικά και το χρειαζόμαστε και για την ψυχική μας ανθεκτικότητα, να μπορούμε δηλαδή να έχουμε και πιο αργούς ρυθμούς, να χαλαρώνουμε και να μην είμαστε συνέχεια σε αυτό το τρέξιμο. Και αν δεν το μάθουμε αυτό, δεν μπορούμε να το κάνουμε. Δηλαδή, όταν εγώ διαβάζω το παραμύθι σε σένα, πέρα από την ίδια την ιστορία και αυτό που προσφέρει η ιστορία, είναι ένας χρόνος που περνά εγώ μαζί σου. Εμείς οι ενήλικες, ξέρεις, με τις δουλειές μας, το σπίτι, το τρέξιμο που έχουμε, δεν είναι τόσο αυτονόητο ότι αφαιρώνουμε στιγμές αποκλειστικά στα παιδιά μας. Οπότε το παραμύθι θεωρώ ότι είχε και αυτό το αποτέλεσμα. Δηλαδή ότι είναι ο χρόνος που αφαιρώνουμε στη σχέση μας. Το οποίο και αυτό είναι πάρα πολύ σημαντικό για την ανάπτυξη των παιδιών. Σας εύχομαι μέσα από την καρδιά μου καλές γιορτές και ένα ευτυχισμένο και παραμυθένιο νέο έτος. Hi everybody, I'm Evangelia and I want to wish you a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. May next year be filled with happiness and joy and above all, health. Internationally acclaimed soprano Aliki Hrisohu exploded onto the global music scene following her success in the seventh season of Britain's Got Talent. Her inspirational story, combined with her angelic voice, has captivated audiences from around the world. Aliki, every inspirational narrative begins with the words once upon a time, foretelling one of the magic and adventure that lie ahead. Take us back to the very beginning, the first chapter of your remarkable story. When I was about three, three and a half years old, I started playing the piano. I started piano lessons. I grew up in an extremely musical family. From my papu and my yaya, from my father's side and also my mum's side, playing the accordion, the guitar, uh, piano, my, actually my Greek papu, he used to have a very beautiful tenor-like voice and then my great papu also. So in generally we were a bit like when we grew up, when we were growing up and then my little brother came along, when we would wake up we would instead of speak to each other we would like sing out mommy I want toast or can we go blah blah and we would make like a musical out of it which was quite fun to do. I was born here I went on to live in England when I went for my uh, first degree for my studies. I completed my first year, then I got, it, I got diagnosed at the end of the summer, I got diagnosed with uh, focal encephalitis, which was uh, an adventure I might say because it was quite a while ago, so it wasn't something that, it still isn't something that people very many people know about because sometimes encephalitis is confused for psychological issues because the way you act it's something that doesn't it cannot show like no MRIs no nothing can show what is going on in your brain um, so that was an adventure I had gone through for about a year and then I was able to return back to kind of normality, uh, back to my studies the second and third year. I had never spoken about that. It was like it was, it was a book, it was finished, it was closed, it was continued. And that's what I am like as a person anyway. I get on with things. And whatever's happened always has something to teach you, whether it's a good thing or a bad thing. You might learn something about yourself that you never knew existed before yes. like that 
So it was something I had never spoken about. Uh, it never came up until Britain's Got Talent, actually. A few years ago, I was diagnosed with focal encephalitis. What's that? It's an inflammation of the brain, which meant that I couldn't speak, read, write, walk. Wow. It was a way for me to be able to make an awareness of this because there's so many more people. Things are possible to overcome and you may not be able to overcome it totally because I'm, I, I, am I am one of the very, very lucky few because people with encephalitis, they don't know every day if they're going to wake up and they're going to have a normal day. This was something I had to do, had to be able to reach out to other people. And that's when the Encephalitis Society saw me on Britain's Got Talent and they asked me to be their ambassador. Through Britain's Got Talent, it's given me a platform throughout all the world. So I've had calls from Australia, from New York, invitations from Canada, from, from Europe to go and perform there. You have to grab the opportunities that will come to you from there. You have described your first international album, Reflections, as a journey, a gathering of memories and influences. What was the inspiration behind this unique collection of work? I wanted it to be a collection of who I am as a person, who I am as a performer, because as a performer, I like to sing in very many different languages, like in Italian, in Spanish, in French, in Russian, in Greek. I even sang in Indian once. And I like to explore lots of dis different genres of music because if, if, if music makes me feel happy then that doesn't matter whether it's a ciftatelli or a classical from an opera or from a musical or from a Disney I feel that as an artist I like to be all of that uh, so that's what I wanted my first album to be uh, which is a collection of passionate classics Wouldn't you think my collection's complete? Wouldn't you think I'm the girl? The girl who has everything. Look at this trove, treasures untold. How many wonders can one cavern hold? Looking around here you think, sure, she's got everything. I've got gadgets and gizmos aplenty. I've got who's it's and what's it's galore. You want thingamabobs? I've got 20. But who cares? No big deal. I want more. What encouraged you to explore your Disney side? So many people were asking me, please do some Disney, please do some Disney. And I wasn't, I don't know if I was ready yet. And I don't know if this side of me, my children kind of Come on, mummy. You know, and because we play dress up all the time when we're at home together. I think that's a side of me that I would like people to get to know because I'm. I think sometimes in my performances I I, I might come out as because I I do take my art, you know, seriously and and I just wanted to kind of show my playful side because that's another side of my character that I do have. What is the legacy Aliki Fisoku would like to leave behind? Surely I want to be remembered as a very good mummy to my two boys, uh, as a good wife, uh, a good friend, because I think these are the things that are important. And then, I mean, as um, in your small circle of life, because we all have we all have a circle that we're all going through and I think it's very important to have that. 
you know, after a very big performance that you have, if you go back to your hotel room, because everybody just sees a performer on stage, what happens after that? I like to have, if it's called a legacy, to these people for me that I've I've uh, been able to be a good listener to them, be a good mummy, and uh, to people outside my circle that at one at one time in my life when I've met one person, whether it's a one-time thing or it's a person that I've seen again or if somebody that I've performed to, that they will remember me by something that's made them feel something at that moment. Hi, I'm Roddy Damalis and I'm here with Paul Lambis and his team. We've decided to go Christmassy in absolutely every way. We've decided to make you a couple of delicious, delicious little Christmas goodies, easy Christmas goodies uh, for your guests. And we've decided to decorate as we, uh, um, outside of the, <laughs> the Fence School campus Christmas. Christmas is a time that you can actually just take out everything fabulous and shiny and glitzy and use it. So you'll have a look that I've taken out my candelabrum, I've taken out my grandmother's uh, silverware, every uh, bit of uh, a teapot to decorate with etc. And this is what I'd like you to do because a lot of times we leave these things in the cupboard and we don't actually use them. So back to the food side of things, what I'm going to do for today is uh, create two little startery snacky canapé kind of uh, items that you can serve to your guests on arrival uh, if you're having a dinner party. So the one is going to be dried figs which are stuffed with Rockford cheese and Parma ham and the second one is a brie cheese which is topped with mixed berries, fresh thyme and orange rind. To round off with we're going to use our melo macarona which are the honey and walnut macaroons. Let's start right now with the figs. Of course it depends on where you are <laughs> in the world, uh, figs, fresh figs might be in season. So please feel free to use fresh figs ex instead of the dried figs that I've used over here. What I've done, uh, and again, what a joy to actually have everybody from all over the world besides our beautiful island Cyprus uh, viewing uh, this program today. I find that absolutely wonderful. So hi to everybody from across the globe. What we've done over here is that I've actually just left these dried figs overnight in, uh, in just some cold water. So they become dehydrated and nice and plumped. So what we're gonna do is just take the little top off, cut the cap off like that. You'll see that I've made some extras just in case. So I'm gonna use five of them so you find the, the plumpest, juiciest ones. Okay, and then what I'd like you to do is just really, really gently stick your finger, your thumb, just cut through so that we know that they're all loose. So then what you do is just really gently create a cavity so that we can stuff the Rockford cheese into it. What I'd like you to do now is just take some black pepper and crack it. If you had just taken cracked pepper that you had in a, in a jar somewhere, then you're not gonna get that really fresh peppery flavor. So what we're gonna do is take a piece of uh, a beautifully shaved Parma ham. I mean, you can see it's paper thin. And then I'd like you just to, to take a little ribbon of it and plant it on top of the Rockford and be quite liberal with it. So that's our beautiful Parma ham. We're then going to take the black pepper because we want the, 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 the contrast with the, with the cheese. We want the contrast with the sweetness of, of the fig. And so, and also look at the color because obviously we're looking at color, we're looking at flavor, we're looking at texture, we're looking at the aroma. So these are absolutely gorgeous and those are ready to be popped into the oven. Okay, we've got a baking tray over here. 
which I'm just going to pop them into. And I'm going to set them aside. I have preheated my oven. Um, it's been a standing thing with my mother and I a hundred years uh, been in, in, in the restaurant industry is that I don't know the difference between off and full on, on temperature. So I usually use full and actually just watch it, okay? There obviously are certain recipes that you've got to actually maintain a lower, uh, a lower temperature. But what I'd like you to do is just on uh, fan assisted, uh, uh, turn it on to as high as what your uh, oven will go. So the next one is going to be the brie with mixed berries, fresh thyme and orange rind. What we're gonna do here is that we again, the, the actual sauce could be made two or three days before or if you want to be really cute is go make it two weeks before and freeze it so all that needs to happen is that your sauce is ready or your topping is ready and then you literally need five minutes to pop it into the oven and uh, 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 and, and serve it now the joy of this particular recipe I'm going to chat whilst I'm whilst I'm making, uh, getting it ready. So the joy of this recipe is that you can either do a slab of brie, which we're gonna do and then present it on a beautiful platter, or the other option is, again, what I recommend to people is, is to actually take those five minutes extra and actually plate uh, individual uh, items, either your starters, your main course, your soup, etc. Or you can do an entire four, five, six course meal by taking five minutes extra and plating six or, or eight dishes. It takes absolutely no time and it takes just that little bit more creativity and you'll dazzle uh, your guests. For me, there's nothing worse than going to all the effort and then just taking your salad or taking your, your sides, chucking them into a, in, into a bowl and putting them onto, onto the table. You've gone to so much effort um, and take it to the extra to, to that extra little uh, level so we want an orange a nice ripe orange and what we want is the finest part of your uh, grater and what we want to do is just remove the rind however what a lot of people make the mistake of is going too far down the skin you do not want to see white you don't want to see the actual pit so what we're going to do is just take the outer layer immediately the entire space uh, has the aroma of fresh fresh orange so what happens here is that you go just the rind uh, because you don't want to have that bitterness in, in in your topping you want the freshness of the orange take either your hand Again, guys, don't be scared of getting your hands dirty. So, we've popped the orange rind into the, into the saucepan. What we want to do is add some sugar to this. I'm not going to give you quantities. A, because I can't deal with having to weigh and measure. Uh, it turned me inside out to create my two uh, uh, recipe books that, that, that I've uh, uh, produced. And the, uh, it was the most incredibly, incredibly uh, uh, creative experience. But the worst part of it was weighing and measuring in order to, uh, to, 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 to formulate the recipes. But what I am gonna do is that I'm going to send uh, the recipes for Paul to, to, to publicize for you. So all the grams and, and, uh, and, and measurements and, 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 and templates temperatures etc will, will be there. Actually there's no way I've ever taken a spice and used a spoon or a measuring. It's, it's that. It's that. And the other thing that I swear by is that if I've made a recipe a thousand times I will still taste it before uh, uh, I, I actually serve it. So we all, we're all human. We might stop halfway through a recipe and go and answer a phone or a door uh, uh, and, and and, and we might forget a key ingredient. So always, always taste before you, before you serve. Okay, so we've got that over there. We now have some beautiful fresh thyme, which I've gotten straight out of my new herb garden, which I'm really, really proud of. So fresh, fresh thyme. Again, as we said with the pepper, it smells gorgeous as it is. However, if you extract the, the, the maximum flavor out of the thyme or any fresh herb by just rolling over it, 
you'll see that you're extracting the essential oils and, and, and extra flavor out of it. So it's the same ingredient and if you don't do that, you're not getting maximum flavor. Another way of handling that is just taking the back of a spoon and just smacking it, but very gently. I mean, don't take all your frustrations out on it. Just pat it gently so that you can actually get the flavor out of it. So here we go. These are going to pop into, the, into here as well. And then what we're going to do is just slice our orange over here and just squeeze the extra juice into that. Of course, I could just use a lemon squeezer, but then I wouldn't look as fabulous as what I'm trying to look right now. <laughs> <laughs> and I wouldn't be getting my hands dirty. So there's your extra flavor and we're not throwing anything away. I have a, an incredible aversion to throwing things away. What I now want to do is just add a little bit of water just to get it to consistency. And then I'm just gonna show you what we're looking like right now. And this is just gonna get popped onto the stove to simmer. Whilst that's simmering, we're just going to prepare the brie. What I'd like you to do is just take the brie and take a sharp knife and just score it. We could just pour our sauce right over this. However, if we're scoring it, the actual flavors are going into the brie. It's the same as marinating a piece of chicken or a, a pork chop or a steak or something like that. And if you, if you want, you could and just score it very, very discreetly so that, so that the, the, the marinade actually permeates uh, uh, the steak or the, or the chicken fillet. So with that over there is ready. What I'm going to do now is go back to, the, to our saucepan and show you how it's bubbling away and show you the consistency that the syrup has to get to. So you'll have a look over here and you've got nice, thick, plump, lazy bubbles. So what, what you have over here is a syrup that pours in one single stream. So if that was pouring in droplets, it means that the syrup has not bound yet. So what we're going to do here is just remove the thyme and into this syrup that we have over here. What we're going to do now is just take our berries. For those of us that don't live in countries that have fresh berries, etc., I've used frozen berries and I'm an advocate of frozen certain items because of the fact that you have consistency. So what I've got is some really good quality frozen mixed berries, which I'm going to pop in here, and I, I want the sauce as well. We're not going to cook the berries, so that's as far as what we go. The only thing we're gonna do now is add some black pepper. There we go. Our oven is hot. It's been preheated. We're now going to take our, our berry sauce and pour it over the brie. I'm going to leave a couple of the berries in the saucepan just to, to decorate on top afterwards. So that's all we're going to do now. That's going to get popped into the oven with the figs. We're now going on to our dessert. Beautiful glasses, use a champagne glass, use a wine glass, use a parfait glass, use a beautiful dish if you have to, as long as it's beautiful and you feel proud to present it. We're now going to start off with our melo macarona, which as we mentioned are honey and walnut macaroons, also with a hint of orange. Christmas starts for me in Cyprus when, when the Melo Macarona start coming out in the, in, in the bakeries. So over here, I've done just a plain custard, full, uh, full uh, uh, cream uh, milk, etc., etc. Don't do my, don't do any of those skimmed goodies, etc., because this is Christmas and you want all the flavor. So it's got vanilla, but it's got a pinch of cinnamon as well. So we're just going to pour over. You'll see that the consistency is quite thick because I don't want it to, to, to melt the melomacarona. 
So do you see that we're just adding a little bit over there and then we're going to just crumble another one on top loosely a little more of the custard so that's what we've got over there and then I've got some walnuts that I'm going to sprinkle on top and that's your dessert absolutely easy absolutely gorgeous absolutely Christmassy just before you're going to serve them you're going to take your cinnamon syrup and do that with there we go our figs are out and our brie is absolutely gorgeous so what we're going to do now is just pop the brie onto a platter what we're going to do is just turn the, pour the caramelized syrup over the brie around the platter and that to me is one of the most gorgeous gorgeous starters we've kept some of our berries and those will be scattered beautiful Christmassy colors so talking about getting out all those beautiful beautiful uh, uh, things from 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 the cupboards uh, that we don't use all year this is a magnificent fish and hand carved uh, bone bone handle fish knife I know it's not appropriate but it's beautiful so that's why we're going to use this Kalisa Sorexi, bon appétit. Nice and easy, hopefully very, very impressive. Uh, I'd like to wish everybody the most beautiful, beautiful Christmas. I'd like to wish you a fun-filled, carefree Christmas and above all, a healthy Christmas and, and, and festive season. I would like as well to thank everybody for their wonderful, wonderful response and uh, support of my new project up here at, at My View. As you see, this is my kitchen. This is where all the new magic is happening. Uh, I'm looking forward to welcome uh, to welcoming the rest of you that haven't been here so far i'm looking forward to welcoming my Pyatakia guests that I, I i have become friends with and family with over the years and uh, again wishing everybody the most beautiful 2022 <laughs> Since its inception in 2018, the Cyprus Choral Association continues to expand its creative vision through meaningful and impactful performances that reawaken audiences through the power of choral music. Αυτό που με ενέπνευσε στο να φτιάξουμε τον Παγκύπριο Σύνδεσμο Χοροδιών ήταν κυρίως η ανάγκη για συλλογικότητα και ομαδική δουλειά μέσα στην, στην Κύπρο γιατί 
Είναι κάτι που το είχα πάντα μέσα μου. Μ' άρεσε πάντα να δουλεύω με, με πολλού ανθρώπου, δεν μ' άρεσε να δουλεύω μόνο μου. Και είχαμε την ιδέα να σμίξουμε αρκετού ανθρώπου που συμμετέχουν στι χοροδίε, που ηγούνται των χοροδιών, να προσπαθήσουμε να φτιάξουμε κάτι μαζί. Να δημιουργήσουμε. Χωρί να ξέραμε ε, τι, τι συγκεκριμένα ήταν αυτό. Όταν ήρθαμε όλοι μαζί κοντά, προσπαθήσαμε να ρίξουμε κάποιε ιδέε και έτσι ήρθε και η ιδέα τη Παγκύπρια Χοροδία. Επομένω, αυτό που με ενέπνευσε ήταν όντω η ανάγκη μου να δουλέψω μαζί με πολλοί κόσμο. Μουσική υπάρχει πάντα και παντού σε όλου μα. Νομίζω δεν υπάρχει κάποιο άνθρωπο που δεν έχει στη ζωή του τη μουσική. Εγώ ε, την ένιωθα πάντα δίπλα μου τη μουσική στη ζωή μου. Ένιωθα πάντα ότι είναι η συντροφιά μου. Δεν, δεν, δεν ήξερα αν θα γίνω μουσικό ή αν δεν θα γίνω μουσικό. Είχα και άλλε κλήσει, αθλητισμό κτλ. Όμω την πορεία μεγάλωνε. Μεγάλωνε αυτό. Όταν, όταν ειδικά ξεκίνησα να ασχολούμαι με όργανο, δηλαδή να αγοράσαμε μια κιθάρα, εκεί άρχισαν τα πράγματα να περνούν το δρόμο του. Και κατάλαβα ότι δεν θέλω να κάνω τίποτε άλλο παρά μουσική. Πάντα μου αρέσει η ιστορία, η διεθνή ιστορία, αλλά και η ιστορία μα, γιατί έχουμε έναν πολύ σπουδαίο πολιτισμό. Επομένω, προσπαθούμε το ρεπερτόριο να κινείται μέσα και σε κλασικά πλαίσια διεθνή, αλλά προσπαθούμε να προσεγγίζουμε συνθέτε που είναι συνηθισμένοι με τον πλούσιο αυτών πολιτισμών τη Ελλάδο και τη Κύπρου. Όταν φτιάξαμε το σύνδεσμο και το μεγάλο σύνολο, υπήρχε ένα ολόκληρο κύμα. Δηλαδή, νιώθαμε ότι άλλαζε κάπω ένα μέρο τη εποχή εδώ στην κοινωνία μα, γιατί. Προσπαθούμε να δίνουμε κυρίω μηνύματα κοινωνικά μέσα από το έργο μα. Δεν είναι μόνο το μουσικό, ούτε και μεγαλώνοντα, ξέρει, καταλαβαίνει ότι δεν ενδιαφέρομαι μόνο για τη μουσική. Θέλω να έχει επέκταση στην κοινωνία. Αυτό μα ενδιαφέρει κυρίω. Επομένω, μέσα από τα παραδείγματα που, ευ... που βγαίναν από αυτόν τον μεγάλο σύνολο, νιώσαμε ότι ναι, είναι καιρό να το πάρουμε και κάπω πιο κοινωνικά. Έτσι, είχαμε κάνει μια μεγάλη περιοδία. Το 19 μόλι άλλαξε ο χρόνο για τον αντικαρκυνικό. Σε όλη την Κύπρο, τρει συναυλίε ήταν κάτι το, το μαγικό. Αυτό που με μείνει στο μυαλό είναι ότι ίσω για πρώτη φορά στην Κύπρο γεμίσαμε τα πιο μεγάλα θέατρα τη Κύπρου με μια συναυλία καθαρά χοροδιακή, χωρί τίποτε άλλο. Ήταν μόνο χοροδία. Νιώθω πολύ ενθουσιασμένο με το τελευταίο πρόγραμμα που έχουμε για την προώθηση τη κυπριακή μουσική τη χοροδιακή στο εξωτερικό. Είναι αυτό που νιώθω έτσι, με κάνει να νιώθω γεμάτο. Επομένω, τα νιώθω όλα σε έναν, σε έναν υψηλό επίπεδο ε, υπερηφάνεια. Θέλουμε να κάνουμε κάθε φορά κάτι νέο, κάτι καινοτόμο και κάτι που να τραβήξει τον κόσμο να μάθει. Να μάθει, σημαντικό να μάθει και μέσα από τον κόσμο θα μάθουμε και εμείς. Επομένως, δεν έχω κάποια συγκεκριμένα σχέδια το ότι θέλω να τραγουδήσω στο τάδε μέρο ή στο, ε, με εκείνον το ρεπερτόριο. Θέλω να νιώθω κάθε φορά ότι αυτό που κάνουμε έχει ουσία και μια νέα ουσία που να δίνει στην κοινωνία μας ένα παράδειγμα 
και να ακολουθήσουν κι άλλα παιδιά πιο μετά από εμάς. Εύχομαι το 2022 να είναι μια χρονιά γεμάτη πολιτιστική δραστηριότητα, δημιουργία και κοινωνική προσφορά. I'm Joseph Borges, the Honorary Council of Kingdom of Tonga. I would like to wish you all prosperity and health for 2022. Ferrishamis is at the home of one of Limassol's five-star resorts, meeting customers' changing demands, at the same time continuing her grandfather's legacy into a new and innovative era. Ferra, the history of the hotel and resort began in the 1970s when tourism in Cyprus was starting to take flight. What was the vision of the resort back then and how has this evolved over the years? You know, I'm so happy you asked me that actually because I've been spending a lot of time concentrating on this very subject and it's something that I do want to delve into more next year, 2022, as part of my plan to relay what was the initial vision of the hotel and how It has actually stayed the same even though it's evolved into modern times. So my grandfather had the vision for the hotel in the 70s and his original idea actually was to have a resort hotel and marina in Lebanon. But obviously with the war and everything else that happened there that wasn't possible. And he came to Cyprus just to bring his business here um, only for a year before moving it over to Paris and he fell in love with Cyprus. And there's so many people who have so many stories about why he fell in love with Cyprus and what it was that really drew him to the island. One of the big reasons was that he was a devout Greek Orthodox and he felt that he wasn't a minority here. And another was obviously the culture. Um, it was very similar to Lebanon and the climate and the way of living. And um, he loved it. He really fell in love with the island and he really wanted to give back. The marina was the first marina, a private marina in Cyprus, and it's an official port of entry. So it really was the birthplace of a lot of companies evolving out of that and having their bread and butter. And it was very nice. A few years ago, we did our 30 year anniversary party, and so many people came up to me and they said, you know what, our whole life our whole industry, our whole way of living has come out of this marina because we got into, whether it was some form of yachting or marine or um, so many other industries came out of it. So it was really, really nice to hear. Um, and this was something that my grandfather was very, very insistent on. Um, at the time, Cyprus did not have foreign uh, investors owning 100% of a company. They could be here, but only with a 49% maximum share of a company. And he was adamant that this was to be his company, his baby for his family. And he did not want just a hotel because they did say, okay, we'll let you have a hotel. And he was absolutely adamant, has to have a marina as well. So it really is a resort, a resort and a marina. Um, it's a whole project in itself. It's a whole little village world here. How did your career in the hotel industry unfold? When I was growing up, I wanted to be a writer and an artist. So, and I was adamant that that was what I was going to do. And um, I loved creative writing and I loved painting. And um, during my, my secondary schooling uh, years, um, I started to think more about business. And um, I still love painting and I love writing, but At the time, I said, well, this is something I can get into later on in my life. Like I can, you know, be, I remember being saying, I can be 50 and go and do it, but I can't be a writer and artist and be 50 and go into business. So I then, I decided, okay, no, I did want to go into business. And I did, I was always very close with my father. So I did spend a lot of time with him growing up and he was always talking about work. I would follow him to meetings. I always knew I wanted to be in Cyprus and I knew I wanted to be involved in one way or another. So that's when, yeah, I said I'm coming here. What are some of the biggest challenges that you are facing to improve the guest experience today? Well, the biggest right now is the health and safety, and it's the expectations of the health and safety that is tough, because some people come from different cultures or different backgrounds and they're fed up. They don't, they don't want to wear a mask, they don't want to look at a hand sanitizer, they just, they've done their tests, and they come to Cyprus, they come to St. Raphael, and they're like, that's it, we're done, we want to relax. 
and other people are still following the rules and reading up every day what, what should be done, what are the new regulations and they're wearing their masks and they're sanitizing and they're putting gloves on and then they see someone who isn't and it's managing that and trying to implement that and trying to make sure everyone's happy but they're still following all the health and safety guidelines that we're given from the ministry and from the, from the European as well commissioners, it's all over. So that's tough in itself and then offering the same relaxing experience that somebody wants when they're on holiday or if they're here for business in a safe environment. We do consider that we offer a very high standard but we've had some very you know, discerning and difficult clients come through the doors so it's been on managing that expectation and, and also understanding and having a lot of empathy because it's not their fault you know people have been so frustrated they've got off a very stressful plane journey even to get here so it's understanding that and basically saying look we're on the same same side we're you know on the same team let's all calm down and let's move on from here make sure you have a wonderful stay in Cyprus and on for the most part we've managed quite well. The iconic tower at St. Raphael Resort is a luxury 14-story residential complex that offers an unparalleled living experience. What was the inspiration behind this one-of-a-kind landmark? We have um, 120 square meter two-bedroom apartments so large luxury apartments with two bedrooms but they can accommodate up to six people in them. Then we have our larger three bedroom apartments which are 240 square meters. Then we have the penthouse which is 480. So some people are living here. Um, some people are in between here and another country so this is their base in Cyprus. And we have other apartments that people are just frequenting for holidays and short term. When you're staying here you get exclusive use of the rooftop bar which is um, a pool area, beautiful swimming pool, 14 meters long, so you can do really nice laps with an infinity pool. And then there's a gym there as well. There's also just a lounge area and sun deck area. So that's exclusively for the residents of the tower. And then there's obviously room service and daily cleaning and everything else. And then you get to use all the facilities of the hotel, including the spa, the indoor pool, the outdoor pools, the gardens, the beach, all the restaurants. So you're luxury living within a hotel, but being private as well. There's no problem that doesn't have a solution. And that's what I say all the time. I say it to my kids, they're like, oh, we want you, mommy. I'm like, okay, well, what's the problem? We'll find a solution. At work, oh, this has happened and it's a disaster. We've got the clients arriving. Okay, well, what's the solution? So for every problem, there's a solution. Might not be the ideal thing you have in mind at the time, but we can find it. Hello, I'm Christo Chagallis, I'm a photographer and a photographer of the school of Chagallis from Cyprus. I wish you good Christmas, good New Year, and I hope that the next year, 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 ένας χρόνος ο οποίος να μπορούμε να ονειρευτούμε, να σχεδιάσουμε και να δούμε τον εαυτό μας μπροστά στο μέλλον με αισιοδοξία. As representative in a Commonwealth nation, the British High Commissioner maintains and develops relations between the United Kingdom and Cyprus, working closely with the Cyprus government on a wide range of issues. Your Excellency, Cyprus and the UK have traditionally enjoyed exceptional relations premised on deep friendship, mutual respect and close cooperation. Let us start at the beginning and what inspired you to join the diplomatic service? Well, I guess it's because of my love of languages originally. Uh, so I always uh, enjoyed and loved studying languages at school. Uh, I went on to study French and German at university. But also had a fascination with the world around us, with international relations. And so in a way diplomacy is the perfect uh, career. It brings together all of those things. And I joined the Foreign Office, the Diplomatic Service, straight from university and I've been doing it ever since. I was born in Bradford in Yorkshire, so I'm eligible to play cricket for Yorkshire, but not uh, actually good enough. I grew up in Nottingham, and that's where I went to school and uh, with which I still have many connections. In 2018, you assumed charge as British High Commissioner to Cyprus. What are some of the initiatives you have taken that have helped forge stronger ties and further enhance the cooperation between the two countries? Inevitably, my period here coincided with Brexit and with the departure from the European Union of the UK. And one of my biggest missions here has been to say just because we're leaving the European Union doesn't mean that our relationship between Britain and Cyprus should be any less strong. And I think we all know that the relationship has some very 
strong uh, and deep foundations. It's a very wide-ranging relationship. I mean, it's political, but it's also about business. It's about education. It's about tourism. It's about people. And there are actually many more things that we can be doing in the future, I believe, around technology, around shipping, for example. You know, my job is really to make a reality of that, so build the connections with the business sector, with the government, with political circles, uh, and ensure that just because we're outside the European Union, that the relationship is not going to become weaker and more distant in the future. You have held key positions in countries such as the Philippines, India, China, and now in Cyprus. How challenging was it to travel extensively from one country to the next and balance a personal life with a family? I mean, that is, yeah, it's part of the diplomatic lifestyle and I suppose one of the challenges of being a diplomat is having to keep moving house and home uh, to different countries, coming and going between the UK and other countries. Uh, my sons obviously have attended schools in many different countries, in China, in India, in the Philippines, in the UK, and that does raise some challenges for them. At the same time, it's also, I think, a fantastic opportunity and in, in many ways a privilege and um, for, for the children of diplomats, that chance to be exposed to different cultures uh, and to widen your horizons uh, in that way. Um, I think you know, many people who are not in the diplomatic service would rightly think that's a, uh, a nice problem to have. How many British citizens are currently living on the island and how significant would you say is their role in further consolidating and integrating the cultural aspects of both countries? It's hard to know really how many Britons uh, there are here at any one time, but I would say that a figure of about 70,000 Britons across the island would be um, a fair estimate. So that is you know, obviously uh, the largest foreign community here. Uh, in the Republic of Cyprus um, and a community that I believe is is well integrated. I mean our Britons uh, they love being here in Cyprus um, they've chosen to to make their lives here I think they contribute um, a range of different things to to society. Um, some of them are working here but actually many of them are older they're retired but they tend to be very active retirees, they, they particularly like volunteering, so I'm very pleased with the way that they're integrated. When our previous Foreign Secretary Dominic Raab came to Cyprus in February, he met the Foreign Minister, Mr Christodoulides. They agreed that we should work together to, uh, to reach a, uh, an agreement, what we call in diplomatic speak, a memorandum of understanding on developing and broadening uh, our relationship and there's a lot going on in the UK Cyprus relationship. This year has actually been really busy in the area of defence cooperation so that's a, a growing area which is obviously very important because we know that uh, the eastern Mediterranean is a complex region so talking about defence and security is very important. The Deputy Minister of Shipping here um, good friend, he uh, will be visiting London for the International Maritime Organization meetings, but that's also a chance for him to meet with his UK counterparts. Shipping is obviously a big sector for both the UK and Cyprus, so thinking about how we work together more closely on that, including addressing some of the challenges that the shipping sector is facing in the 21st century. Um, have been the challenges of obviously around COVID, but um, the climate change agenda, reducing carbon emissions from shipping, but also security of shipping, the challenges, the threats to shipping from, uh, from cyber attacks. These are all areas that we need to be thinking about. So there's a very uh, wide and rich agenda of things that uh, we are talking about and more that we can do in the future. I was fortunate enough to meet uh, Prince William, the Duke of Cambridge and the Duchess of Cambridge when they uh, visited, uh, I think that was 2019, 
and we were also very pleased to be able to host President Anastasiades at Buckingham Palace at the beginning of 2019. Prince Charles, the Prince of Wales, hosted a reception for, for the President then, so there's been some very good interaction at that level. You received a CMG in 2017 for services to UK relations with Asia, which was presented to you by His Royal Highness the Duke of Cambridge at Buckingham Palace, shortly before you came to Cyprus. Would you consider this as one of the most defining moments in your career? It was a, an, an honour both to be nominated for it and then to go to Buckingham Palace with my family and receive it from uh, Prince William. The CMG, it's, it's a order that one receives for overseas service uh, predominantly. It's quite interesting because its history it was founded in the 19th century originally for service in the uh, Mediterranean and the Ionian Islands when, um, uh, when Corfu and the Ionian Islands were uh, under British uh, administration and also of course Malta. Um, so there's a sort of CMG connection to uh, to this part of the world as well. There's still plenty to do in Cyprus and I'm, I'm hoping still plenty for me to do in the, uh, in the world of diplomacy. So I'm, I'm not thinking about retirement yet. Stefan Theo is an actor, illustrator and co-author of a children's book written with J.L. Moran, an award-winning novelist. Their new work is a diverse rhyming children's book that teaches one how to overcome childhood fears. J.L., you're the author of numerous award-winning books for readers of all ages. When did you first realize you wanted to be a writer? I had been writing for a long time before I realized that it was going to be a career. I had been keeping diaries for school and just writing my thoughts for years from the time I was 12, I think. My first year at university, um, one night we pulled an all-nighter and I was with my roommate sitting on the terrace in a blanket and we watched the other kids going to school in the morning and it just hit me that nobody could know everything and that it was more important to be creative and expressive and to say what I needed to say and I knew that writing was going to be my passion. As I write, the novel teaches me what I'm writing about and sometimes the things even materialize in my life. Um, wondering if I'm encanting some of the things that I'm writing about and that's become very interesting lately when I've seen things happen that I was writing about. For example, in Love Life, I was writing about a virus and then there was a virus. But with also with the children's book, it was a chance to use other media. So I was using my rhymes and Stefan's rhymes and he illustrated it and so we got to put art together with writing. A lot of times these days, children's books are kind of manufactured. They don't match the writer with the, the writer is not the same person as the illustrator. So in this case, we got to work closely together and Stefan was both illustrating and writing and I was writing as well. And so it was more organic. It wasn't mechanical at all. Many writers describe themselves as character or plot writers. Which one are you and what do you find to be the hardest part of writing? I think I started out as more of a character driven writer and moved toward plot because when I got into the science fiction um, it's much more motivated by ideas and it's like a puzzle that has to fit together. The characters are still very strong but there's more of a plot emphasis in Lovoid than than the earlier books. Um, but a lot of people have said that's my best one, so I guess that it depends on what you do well and what works in the situation. The hardest part is probably being consistent at it, getting the time, making the space to be able to write. There's another side of writing, for example, marketing the writing, promoting the book, and. There's, there's a business side to it as well, so once you get into these other kinds of practicalities, it's hard to get back to the inspiration. It helps to be in a place like Cyprus. Cyprus, as the name of the country denotes, is rich in copper, and I think that that contributes to the energy and electricity that I feel here. 
and that so many people feel here. Um, there's something really metaphysical about it. I think we're actually calling down energy to this area and it's very inspiring. Stefan Tuckatuck Dragon brings to life the soothing tale of an outcast dragon who overcomes childhood fears, bravely lulling a pair of scary babies to sleep with his magical sand. What was the inspiration behind your book? Honestly, uh, this was um, my bedtime story. I was writing it with my mom. I was learning to speak and make stories around the same time, around two years old. Uh, we started and only recently did we think of putting the story together in a book with the paintings and adding a touch of like who we are now in this moment after 20 years. I guess we just wanted to share that moment with other, other families, other children who are young in today's age and we also wanted to do something different. What specific message do you want to convey through your work? The dragons are scared of the babies and it's like you're putting a villain, but villain, like it's a, it's a stereotype because dragons are scary. You're putting a child or a, the reader in the villain's perspective, but the villain is scared of like the most innocent stereotype we have, which is a baby. And that, I think, opens the mind. It gives a, a different perspective that's not really, well, it might be given, but to me it was rare. To me, I, uh, I saw like the simple complexity of everything as like mind opening and just in general, like the more options someone has, the more perspectives, the more choices they will feel, they will feel free. JL, you have given so much over the course of your career. What are your goals for the future and do you have another story on the boiling pot? Well, I was really glad to do the last book, Tuck a Tuck Dragon, which involves painting, um, getting into other media, getting into film, making one of the books into a screenplay would all be interesting to me. Uh, yeah, and maybe even trying a, a non-fiction book, why not? When I'm in Cyprus, I never need help getting up in the morning. I'm psyched. <laughs> From the time I open my eyes, I know it's going to be a new day. So many different, strange, unexpected things have happened that I'm sure that more things can happen. So, if anything, the motto would be not to impose my expectation on the day. Let it happen so that I can see the opportunity or the things that are happening because if you bring your expectations to it then maybe you see it a certain way and you don't see until afterwards oh i should have done this i should have said that or you don't notice what the possibilities really were they are true ambassadors of hellenism admired respected and socially active they are an invaluable asset not only to their country of destination but also, and more importantly, to their country of origin. Yana, you have worked in television for many years. For people who aren't familiar with your work, let's start about how you got into this and what led you to becoming president and CEO of NGTV. I was on, on the Greek uh, uh, English language news division of Antenna. I was hosting English language news. I was writing. We were. I was doing the uh, primetime news for the, that division of Antenna Satellite. I was on Prona Cafe uh, since 1994. My career evolved into just co-hosting and hosting various things as my group got better and thereafter went back to college to get seriously more involved in the media world because I invested so much time in media that I wanted to get my second degree so I can continue uh, that profession on a more um, on, a, on another level and so then went on to work with Ertz uh, satellite I did the first English language show for national Greek television Ertz it was called Hellenic Weekly, where we reported news, we reported uh, what was happening in Greece, uh, in Option to the the Olympic Games. And thereafter, I was very um, honored to have been invited to co-host the opening and closing ceremony of the Athens Olympic Games as a master of ceremonies. 
I did 80 documentaries on Greece, uh, advertising Greece abroad through ERT. I'm happy to have uh, been the pioneer in the English language uh, space about Greece abroad. I've had a great career as well, modeling. I was very fortunate to have worked with all the designers. I did a lot of catalog and also runway. I walked the runway for amazing designers. So it was a an amazing, wonderful, uh, era for me. I was on TV every day. I was very lucky, but my parents were like, it's time for you to come home. You know, I'm, a, I'm born and raised New Yorker of Greek uh, background. I thought, you know what, I'll go back for a little bit. You know, I'll stay and I'll come back to Greece. I was trying to do the Greek, you know, in America thing, but ended up staying in America because I was offered an opportunity to be a, a partner in a, in a Greek uh, American television channel, the only Greek American television channel in the United States. Uh, and so it was a great opportunity to continue preserving and pr pr promoting Hellenism in America and Canada. And I, I kind of just fit right into that role. Over the years, you have been highly centered on holistic wellness and original medicine. What draws you to this area? I think the future of the world is alternative integrative medicine and nutrition. So I decided to go back for my PhD in, um, in naturopathic medicine. Uh, so I'm finishing uh, a, a, my doctorate in naturopathy. So I'll have a, I'll be a doctor, a naturopathic doctor, and my PhD in original medicine, which is the Hippocratico. It is the original medicine prior to pharmaceuticals. So it is. That's why they call it original medicine. It's all under the umbrella of medicine because uh, medicine is only one thing. And new medicine, uh, new generation medicine was conventional medicine, which has to do with pharmaceuticals. And prior to the pharmaceuticals entering the space and of course excel excelling in, in, sur in surgical uh, uh, practices, it was a healing through homeopathy. And so uh, they're all necessary. We need preventive medicine, which is what I do in, to prevent and keep you well. And then we do need conventional medicine, of course, to fight any crisis or any in, imbalances, of course, in the system and bacteria and viruses and so forth. So during COVID, I found it very interesting that this is the this is where I believe the world is going towards, you know, that is health and wellness. It's a very big part of our lives. What has been the most inspirational moment in your career so far? I feel very blessed that I've met and interviewed many people and every single one of these people have uh, been an inspiration on some level or another and I'm sure touched the audience. And it's, it's, it's hard to find people that, are, uh, that the audience will be moved by. It really is because everybody's moved by different things. That's why everything and everyone is important for different reasons. I would like to recreate and I'm trying to uh, recreate a uh, modern day Asclepio which is a center for health. And I'd like to do it in Greece, and I'd like to do it on the island that I hail from, Kos. That's going to be the first one. And I'm working with a group of doctors to try and do that. Because we want to present to visitors, and of course, Greeks alike, and Cypriots, a, a, to go back. We need to go back sometimes to go forward. So we need to go back into nature. We need to go back uh, into history and and through a lot of these methods, bring us back a little bit more balanced to nature and try and figure out what may be going on within ourselves that uh, is causing an imbalance of an illness of some sort of, not only physical, but mental. So we need to understand that mind, body, whole uh, uh, theory is is Hippocrates theory. And, and this is what I um, try to represent. I love the Cypriots and I love Cyprus and I cannot wait to get down there and, and, and present you guys to the rest of the world. Christos from Cyprus to Los Angeles, how did you find your voice as a creative? LA being this you know melting pot of creativity of this you know hotbed of design and you know with the latest trends etc. It attracts all this you know these creatives from all over the world. I was one of those creatives that kind of gravitated to it and kind of, you know, I just, I got seduced. I always like saying, you know, using the word seduce because LA seduces you with its kind of like quirkiness a little bit, a kind of little, you know, craziness. But there's also this kind of vibrant, anything goes attitude. It's not like New York or London where 
design trends are, are very structured somehow. Where in LA, it's kind of like, hey, I want to make a, a pink jacket and just put it down the runway or whatever, right? It's perfectly acceptable. Great, do it. You know, that's the can-do attitude. So within that f kind of framework, I kind of established my firm, which is a creative design firm, which we do, you know, it's a visual communications firm that does, you know, online, print, uh, you know, all that kind of stuff, digital marketing, all that stuff, creative assets for all different clients. And slowly, slowly, you just kind of gain traction and one thing leads to another. And that's how I kind of created my little, you know, flat six concepts. I've always been seduced by simplicity in design, where every design element serves a function. It's in that simplicity where the design becomes invisible, where the design becomes so graceful, so elegant, and so balanced that it transcends time and feels like it's been there all along. The business of design is one of constant editing. Good design is the result of a detailed discipline that eliminates the superfluous and brings order out of chaos. It is that desire for that simplicity that inspires me every day. It is that innate sophistication and intellectual elegance that I strive to emulate and apply to each and every project. It is that yearning to make everything as simple as possible, but not simpler. For me, I partner with clients. I don't take them on as, uh, as a means of uh, income per se. I don't have a quote I need to meet. You know, an agency, a big agency has quotas they need to meet, they have shareholders they have to like satisfy. For me, it's always been about, um, sometimes you have to take clients that will pay your bills. You have to do that. It's just a matter of life. This is the, the, you know, the whole thing. But I do like to see them succeed because that their you know, success brings me more clients, word of mouth, etc. But yes, I do partner with them. I, I, don't, I don't say, you know, I'll take them on. I'll, I, I'll partner with you to get to the point where you want to be. What are your core values? I think integrity is a big thing for me. Um, uh, honesty, transparency. I don't like to, um, I, for me, I will accept, I will take accountability is another big thing. If I screw up, and I, man, I've screwed up a lot of times, <laughs> I, I will take accountability. I will pay. I will if if it's monetary, if it's time, if it's design, whatever it is, I will do it to uh, make it right for the client. Um, is that good business sense? Sometimes it doesn't make business sense because, but in the sense of, I just want to go home. I just want to go to sleep. I just don't want to have any. You know, I, I just want to sleep well at night. COVID really affected obviously everyone right but i noticed in cyprus as well i mean uh, the economy again we're going through this kind of you know this up and down and all this kind of stuff and it affected the economy the tourism kind of factor for cyprus which is so dependent on just foreign people coming in and spending money i just had this feeling that people were just losing you know their morale they were just the unhappy people were just depressed from this you know kind of you know pandemic that was just upending their world and life right so i felt really touched by trying to do something for nicosia my town my place so i said why don't we just kind of brand let's simplify let's create this mark and cyprus ready meant cyprus is ready to, for change like you said but also for someone to be cyprus ready like you know i I'm going to Cyprus. So are you Cyprus ready? Like for example, are you ready to go visit Cyprus? Are you ready for it? Are you, did you get your gear? Did you get your swimming suits? Did you get your, you know, are you Cyprus ready? Like, you know, are you ready for to go on a vacation or whatever it is that may be? And that's essentially what, you know, it came, came about. My dad inspired me in many ways that I never understood at the time. Uh, being an architect, being in the design world, you know, being exposed to this kind of aesthetic i think subconsciously i think he was the prototype if you will of you know my kind of aesthetic you know there's this uh, novelist julie alvarez she said um I, I and i always love this it's um you know don't try to control 
everything. Let life unfold as it may. You know, so I'm paraphrasing that, but just like, let go. Don't, don't try to control it. Let, let life surprise you a little. That's exactly what she said. And for me, that is very comforting at times of, you know, whether it may be difficulty or, you know, whatever it may be. But once you let go and kind of accept everything for what it is, then you're kind of okay. You'll be fine, you know? It's just taking that step of just accepting and just, hey, you never know what might happen, you know? That's, that's a good way of looking at life for me, I guess. Katie, for over two decades, you have marked your own territory as a powerful woman. You have carved your own path, simultaneously creating opportunities for others. When did you first realize that language has power and how did your passion for journalism stem out? So that language has power is something that I think I always knew, but I became acutely aware of that call in later years. Because I think as you mature, so you realize the real power of language and words. And I think it's got a lot to do with the fact that journalism is about language, it's about words, it's about meaning, it's about getting a deeper understanding. And even the smallest word that may appear on the surface to be innocent actually might have a totally different meaning to some people. And it's been so important for me in my career, especially in South Africa, to understand that some words are not just innocent, but actually they've got power, they can be dangerous, they can be harmful, and, and that actually they can be very, very hurtful. And, and that's a space that I've really enjoyed learning in, because it has been about learning. I've always had a passion for news and for journalism. To a large degree, I can actually credit my mom for that. You know, I remember driving to school in the morning and all the other kids would tell us that they were listening to, I think it was Radio 5 at the time. We listened to talk radio driving to school. And news and information became a critical part of who I was always. And you know, Paul, in later years, I actually went back to my parents' home and to my old bedroom and I found cuttings of newspapers, of big events, newspaper headlines. If there was ever a big moment, I would cut it out and just stick it in a folder. And I'd completely, completely forgotten about that. But going back, I realized, wow, I obviously had uh, a passion and a love for news and journalism for a very, from a very, very young age. So yes, it has certainly been a calling in my life. You have trained, mentored and inspired a generation of reporters and editors in South Africa who went on to win countless journalism awards. Has the pandemic reshaped the journalism field and have we witnessed a collapse in traditional journalism as we know it? I think that's such a critical point and such a critical question. I'll tell you why. Because especially with COVID, there's been a lot of fake news. There's been a lot of misinformation uh, that has been doing the round. So what is our role we have to ask ourselves as media and as mainstream media? And of course, there's also a narrative, which I completely disagree with about what, um, you know, don't believe what the mainstream media says. I I think that's complete nonsense, um, if I do say so myself, because it's not just about believing every Facebook post. It's not about believing every social media post and everything that comes from a large array where you're not necessarily sure who is the source of that. Is that accurate? Has it been verified completely? So I'll often come across posts, this is what the media won't show you. This is what the media won't tell you. And I think, well, what work have you done to actually verify that and to actually research that? So it's important to us that we get a plurality of voices and a diversity of views in the research that we're doing to constantly bring to our audience, and in my case, a television audience that is exposed and, and to whom we can tell the absolute truth because that is critical. Those ultimately, Paul, are the fundamentals of journalism. Truth, ethical journalism, responsible journalism, being fair. Because yes, we all talk about media freedom, but with those freedoms come an enormous sense of responsibility and we've got to own that responsibility. So we cannot also be reckless as members of the media. In 2013, you authored the highly successful book, I'm Missing News, when hard news and parenting collide. What did you want readers to take away from your book? 
first and foremost, I wanted them to enjoy the book. I wanted them to get a bit of an insight into um, these two worlds, this crazy, fast-paced, 24-7 world of news, and then, of course, how one balances that when, you know, the world of news is is not your primary focus. Um, and, and what I did was I asked some other journalists, female journalists, um, in their careers who've had you know, what I believe to be hugely successful careers locally and internationally, if they could also contribute a little chapter each and and share with our with our readers and share with the readers exactly how they balanced it. Because I tell you, Paul, 24-7 news is ruthless. It's absolutely ruthless. You don't know when a story will break, what requirements will be made of you, how you need to rush back uh, to the office or to cover the story. So firstly, I wanted the readers to enjoy it. And secondly, it was really important to be able to say to all career women, actually, not just those in media, that it's okay. We'll make mistakes in either field, whether we're at home or at work, it's fine. Our mistakes don't define us though. It's not what brings us to our knees that is going to be our legacy, but it's how we get up from that, what we learn from that, and how ultimately we'll move on. Nala Media, a company you co-founded with two media colleagues, is a fresh voice in the industry that serves democracy, it enriches diversity and deepens understanding. Tell us about that. So in terms of Nala Media, this was my project after I left um, Prime Media, I was there for a very long time. Nala Media came about, it was the it was the brainchild of, of three uh, very dear friends, uh, me and another two women. And it's about just creating a different voice in South Africa when it comes to media. It's about growing and mentoring and creating amazing content. So I'm really excited because we're about to launch phase two of Nala Media very soon. And that is the launch of the Nala Academy. And this is a project that is very much a passion project for all of us because it's about taking all of our passions around the industry, around journalism and saying, okay, we've all been around for a while, several decades between us. How are we going to grow the next generation? of journalists, of photographers, of content creators who are going to be able to, to tell beautiful stories, not just in South Africa, but in Africa and, and hopefully in the rest of the world. So we're really, really pleased about uh, the launch of, of the Nala Academy. And it's work that we've been doing for a long time anyway. You know, it's the training, it's the mentoring, it's the growing that has already been happening. It's now just under the Nala Academy umbrella. My wishes for 2022 for South Africa, for Cyprus, for Greece, are actually all the same. I wish tolerance, I wish peace, I wish understanding, I wish justice for each and every person in every one of those countries. John, the Hellenic Federation of South Africa is an organization that actively promotes our culture and heritage. How does one raise the profile of Hellenism, especially when you're living among one of the most culturally diverse populations in the world? We have 38 members in, the, in, the, in our federation. Eight of them are cultural societies, and then we have uh, another three very active benevolent societies in and amongst other benevolent societies within the communities and the balance of all the communities throughout South Africa. So we, we, we work well together with all these communities and we keep enhancing all the individual efforts that they do on their own, within their own uh, um, uh, environment. So the communities uh, have got a, a massive task. Each community is usually based around the people in the area, their lens in the area. Uh, with uh, almost always a church and, and, and a community hall, uh, and and uh, they provide services to the community, which in amongst things are first of all our language, uh, which which are community schools. Uh, most of the communities offer a Greek dancing option. One of our newest members, which joined uh, I think maybe five years ago is the newly formed Mary Vassilio Greek Dancing Association and they teach at uh, different centres. They have 300 odd kids in all the communities. So between the dancing and the school and the church, the communities play a massive role in, 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 in keeping that profile, that Hellenic profile alive. 
The first Greeks arrived in South Africa in the 1860s. Over the years, they have managed to rise socially and prosper. Today, they remain one of the most important beacons of Hellenism among the diaspora. What are some of the events organized by the Hellenic Federation for South Africa that promotes the common Hellenic culture? This year, which was the 200th uh, year commemoration of the start of the Greek Revolution, and uh, we created an event, a hybrid event, which was very successful. We managed to sew the, the biggest, biggest hand-sewn hand Greek flag in the world. It really came together quite nicely. What we try to do in this event is include all the facets of our federation and our members. To do all of this within the parameters of COVID, which limited the number of participants, the audience that was allowed to come through, so we had to limit it to invited guests only. So what we did is we live streamed it across the country and in fact internationally to anyone who wanted to um, link onto the live stream and see the celebrations that we were able to offer. That was the only way we could do it. And we are very privileged to be living in an environment and in a country that various cultures flourish, okay? And within, you know, the harmony of being able to identify with your own culture while still living amicably and with harmony in an environment that is so multicultural and accepting of that. Evie, the Federation has continuously rallied for Cyprus, raising awareness of the Cyprus problem. How does the younger South African generation perceive the Cyprus issue? There is consistent awareness uh, within the communities, within the younger set through Nexosa, that we make sure that one never forgets, okay? Um, so we keep the flags uh, up high, we keep awareness of the history of where we are, why, um, what happened, when it happened, and how it affected uh, our future, well, our parents' future and our history and possibly the coming future, you know. Uh, keeping that awareness alive is very much a part of the agenda for both uh, all the community schools, Seheti, which is the pinnacle of our Greek schools in South Africa, uh, are through our churches, through the associations, and we are privileged to have the 38 uh, communities and associations a part of uh, the Federation, so that not only does the Federation promote all of these events throughout the year, we work in tandem with the associations and communities to make sure that whatever they are doing too, we will be by their side to promote it amongst the communities nationwide. My message is remain relative, remain in lean, and become citizens of the world and don't lose your Greek identity. May we continue to progress, improve, learn from our mistakes, and continue to promote uh, Hellenism in every sphere possible, um, you know, across our associations and communities in South Africa, because those really will encompass the youth, the elderly, the churches, um, you know, from all across our communities and across the walks of life. Spiro, the Cyprus community of New South Wales is but one of many organisations in Australia actively promoting our culture and heritage. Tell us about the history of the organisation and how the Cyprus community of New South Wales has evolved over the years. Cyprus, as you know, was a British colony and um, a lot of Cypriots uh, were travelling with British uh, ships or Australians on the, on the Greek ships. And they ended up in Australia in uh, the, the earliest that we can have is about the turn of the century, about 1900. Now the Greek community, for example, the first church, if you like, was organized, in, and, and I say the Greek community because the Cypriots acted as part of the wider Greek community. There was enough people to set up a community and have a church and obvious, obviously maintain a priest and, and all the relevant expenses and all that from uh, 1898. So you, you were the, the, one of the first people that came here were the Castellorisians. And 
To give you an idea, the Castellorisian Club was one of the first Greek clubs to be organized in Australia, and everyone knew it. It, it was the place to be. There was a guy called Aristides. He was from Le Meso. And he ran this coffee shop in what is now the center of Sydney, the city. The Gafanio was the place where all migrants who stepped off the ship when they when they arrived in Australia, usually not knowing anyone, and they had nowhere to go, they had this address. And in the coffee shop, they would meet the other Cypriots who would usually help them with finding a job, finding a room to stay with. From that um, Aristides Cafe Neo started the, the community, they called it the Evagoras Brotherhood, Adelfodita. And the reason why, because the name, it expresses what it was there for. It was purely to help the new migrants. As the years went by and the center became bigger and bigger, we are now in what they call the inner west. So we are a little bit west of Sydney, but in the inner west, that's where the current uh, club is now. From the 1920s, we are actually, in, we've been incorporated for 92 years. The Cypriot community has always punched above its weight. The reason is because we, and as I said, the Australian government sees us as part of the wider Hellenic community. And the Hellenic community is very prominent because there was hundreds of thousands of Greeks that migrated here through the years, and especially in the 50s and 60s. In Sydney, we probably have something like 100 to 150,000. And I say 100, 150, because it depends on how many generations back you go. Cypriots, we probably have, uh, in Sydney, we probably have something like 10,000. People. What are some of the events organised by the Cyprus community of New South Wales that promote the common Cypriot culture? Immediately after 74, uh, there were two organisations that were formed in every state. In every state, we had the SECA, Sindonistigie Pitrobiki Priagua Wonos, or in English, we call it the Justice for Cyprus Committee. So every state had one. And then we had the PASECA, the Pan Australian Justice for Cyprus Committee. The state committees were responsible for primarily for organizing all events to do with publicity, to do with the awareness, uh, to lobby the politicians, um, both state and federal politicians, to raise money. To give you an idea of how active and how we are regarded here in Australia, in the central Sydney, there is the monument, which is the monument of the unknown soldier. And there, only, only Australian organizations are allowed to go and lay wreaths. But the only other one that is allowed is us. The politicians, when we speak to them about Cyprus, they, they take notice. The big things with the community now are the future, i.e. the redevelopment of the land, which is a huge chapter. Um, and, and what it will actually become into the next decades. It will be totally transformed. In our constitution, we actually set four areas of service to the community. And it is stipulated that the money is going to go towards welfare, health, education, and protection of human rights. Human rights because we wanted to include the justice for society, isn't it? What message would you like to convey to the Greek Cypriot community, both in Australia and around the globe for 2022? A lot of people might believe that after so many years, that this is not a winnable um, uh, cause. I believe it is. I believe we're about to see big changes that will actually, history will once more come to our side. The people in Cyprus have to believe in their cause. We have to believe that it is possible. And the biggest thing that we have to prove is that after 47 years, nobody, but nobody dare recognize what is the illegal uh, occupation of Cyprus uh, as an entity. The United Nations said it's an illegal entity. Nobody other than Turkey. What does that tell us? That everybody recognizes that there is something wrong in Cyprus after 47 years. So therefore, let's not underestimate what has been done Let's never give up, never. So, you know, that's the, the, the message that we should all um, adhere to and hopefully we'll all live to see it through. 
Dougie, how did your vision of a Greek language television channel in the UK come to fruition? It became a reality when I went to work for British Telecom. I was a satellite uh, engineer designing satellites at British Aerospace. So one of the first things that I did was to come into terms with cable TV. And suddenly I realized that the capacity of that uh, system, the new technology, was to take at that time 50 analog channels. At that time we only had three channels in England. It was BBC One, BBC Two and ITV. Channel 4 hasn't even started yet. So suddenly to have the capability of having 50 channels, I thought, hey, wait a minute, what are they going to do with content? How are they going to fill 50 channels? So suddenly it sort of turned on me that we could have a Greek language television channel. It took about eight years before uh, there were eight years of sort of toing and froing and whatever, you know. And um, of course in those eight years, I was working closely with the people who were uh, doing cable TV. The BBC were not allowed to finance it. It had to be self-financed. The government decided that the area where Parliament was and whatever had to be the showcase of the country. So the, after licensing the Westminster TV, of course there were no Greeks in Westminster TV, we were not interested. But the next thing, number two, was Campton. That was traditionally the original uh, home of a lot of immigrants from Cyprus. Over the years, they moved to Haringey and Enfield. And, uh, so we started with, with uh, Cable Camden, and the first uh, broadcast was on the 10th of December, 1990. And we had 13 homes connected on day number one. How did the evolution of technology alter the channel's broadcasting capabilities? From 1990, for about 10 years, uh, cable TV was growing and growing and growing. And by 2000, we had uh, more than uh, ooh, seven, 8,000 people connected. So it was, for us, we were happy with it. We didn't want anything else, but then the big shock came when we went from analog TV to digital TV. The cable TV sort of evolved as well in parallel, and we were, we were getting stronger and stronger, getting more and more people as they were connecting more and more homes. We were about 7% of the subscribers at one time. So finally, around about 2016, we, uh, we ended up with the Roku box, which we use now, we use today. And then we st started adding channels. Uh, by then we had two channels, the Hellenic TV 1 and the Hellenic TV 2. Our program was originally three hours a day. We all know that content is king. Let's talk about your programs and what makes them both relevant and engaging. The program content uh, is unique because it's centered around the community in London. Basically, sometimes we go all the way to Birmingham, but it's, it's a way to travel, you know. Uh, we cover one or two events outside London, but mostly it's the events in London. There is, uh, I think, 24 Greek Cypriot teams in London, and they have two divisions, first division and second division. We're we'll going to cover them, and they, in the All England one, for two years running, one of the Cypriot teams went to the final. We have documentaries. We have programs that are specially for us. For example, Yalego Carriera. All our programs is in Greek. We're trying to maintain the Greek language. That was one of the objects of having a Greek language TV channel. We have uh, theaters produced uh, ourselves, Vasilis Panagi. Our studios are in North London, Wood Green. We've been there for ever since we started, really. What has been the most inspirational moment in your life? The start of Hellenic TV was, uh, a year earlier we had the radio, which was, I was part of the team. But I had to leave the radio when TV started. There is a law in England which uh, does not allow you to be, have a controlling interest, they say, in TV and radio and newspaper. You have to choose one of the three. When you set out to do your job, you don't think you're going to make history. You just, 
You don't realize it when you're doing it. You know, you just say, oh, this is, this is a job for which I'm paid to, I have to do it, I have to, you know, do the best I can. I, you know, I'm a professional. And, uh, and that's, that's what it is, you know, you just do your job and when everybody does their job, the thing works. Sometimes you feel the call, you know, you have to do it, you know, you feel that it's your destiny. But uh, while you set off, you know, you set off for your first job, you don't know that you're going to be so successful. You just carry on going and eventually it happens. As 2021 comes to an end, we would like to thank you for your overwhelming support and look forward to the new year with new opportunities and the possibility to change our lives for the better. Until next time, stay safe and let culture transform your life.